at the African resistance to enslavement in Latin America, including slave revolts and the maroon communities. Without any further ado, let me introduce Dr. Ronoko Rashida. How you doing, Doc? <laughs> I'm good, Empress. How are you? No, you look beautiful. So much happening in the world. So anyway, it's nice to be back. This time, I really want to take the full hour, and it's going to be visual. So let's get started. Uh oh. Let's begin here. Now, the last time we talked about the African presence in ancient America, we're talking about the role of African people in classical Mesoamerican civilization. And we spent a lot of time talking about the old Mac. So this is part two, as you indicated, and we are really going to look at the African presence in what I am calling the colonial period of Latin America. And of course, a lot of that will enable us to look at the, um, the history of resistance. And then finally, we'll finish it up next month, God willing, with a look at African people in many of the um, Latin American countries. So important to start off with. I have a lot of photographs to show you. Our history did not begin in chains and will not end in chains. That's why I wanted to start last week with where we were. So today, the first thing I want to do is I want to pay homage to our Native American sisters and brothers. I want to pay tribute to them and salute them for all that they have endured during this period and even now. This is a photograph that I found about, I don't know, three or four years ago in a museum in um, Santiago Tuxla, Mexico. And this is about as cruel as anything I've ever seen. So this is a part of the history that we're looking at that the enslaved African is brought into. And then here's another one. This man is being scourged. And so I salute the Native Americans who, uh, who endured this and who survived it. Now I'm gonna look at things from an African perspective to the best of my ability. And I have to say from the beginning that I am not an expert at this at all, but it's very, very important. And I think I do have something to share with you that will be of value. And so this just takes off just where we left. You have the Native American being scourged, and then you have the enslaved African brought in. So the Americas as we know it are built largely on the land of Native Americans and the, and the labor and blood of African Americans, okay? So these are the scenes that we see from early in slavery days. I think a lot of us are familiar with this. It never gets easier. Here you have an African being branded with a hot iron like an animal. And then this shows us, and these images I've taken from museums in Peru and Mexico City, I mean in Mexico and also Cuba. And this part is probably in Africa itself. Most of the Africans who died as a result of enslavement, as I understand it, died in Africa from the time they were captured and brought to the coastal dungeons where they were then put on those floating coffins called slave ships. And when people talk about all the Africans who died in the transatlantic slave trade, I'm not sure if these numbers are calculated. I don't know if those numbers are from the time they were, we were in the dungeons, our ancestors were, or it starts on the ships, or it starts in the Americas, or it starts in Africa itself from the trauma of being captured, in some cases hundreds of miles inland, and then being marched to the coast. And <clears throat> I don't know how many people have picked these up. I think a lot of us have seen these photographs, a lot of us have seen the pictures, but I've had an opportunity to actually hold these shackles in my hand. And I think one is for the neck and hold them in my hand. They're very, very heavy. And one more example. 
Yeah, it's really hard for me to imagine, and I'm a very good historian, the cruelty that was associated with this barbarous practice. And the fact that we survived this physically, even though we are still mentally and perhaps even physically damaged. So that's what all of these images represent. I'm gonna divide this presentation into about four or five parts. And I must tell you that this is the first time I've done this presentation. I really worked hard on it. And you know, I'm doing it for the first time. So let's see how it goes. And this is a good map. This is from a museum in uh, Lima, Peru. And this just shows where, where some of the Africans were taken from. I'm convinced that African people were taken from even East Africa and Mozambique. And of course, all around the West Coast, Central Coast of Africa, up until uh, at least Senegal and Guinea. And these were the routes, some of the routes at least, the major routes, and these are where the Africans were taken. A large portion went into Veracruz and what is now Mexico or New Spain. A lot were taken to Panama through the port of Portobello. A lot were taken into Cartagena, Colombia. And according to this map, which I had never noticed before, a significant portion were actually taken into what is now uh, Argentina in the Southern Cone. And I'm just, here you are, here's your guide, Renoko Rashidi, a humble servant, hardworking historian. And I post this here just to give uh, acknowledgement that a lot of this information is located in a relatively new museum in Peru, and specifically Lima, the capital, which is an Afro-Peruvian history. And unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your perspective, so much of it is based on slavery and that drives me crazy. It's as though black folk didn't have a history before we were enslaved. And Kwame Ture, one of my great teachers when he was known as Stokely Carmichael used to say in his speeches, if you think your history began with slavery, the best you will hope to be is a good slave. So we have to be very, very careful with that. And I think we've seen these images of how Africans were packed on these ships in some cases, I suppose hundreds. Imagine a ship at sea on the ocean for several weeks at a time, no air conditioning, no toilets, at least for the captives, because slaves didn't come from Africa. Africans were captured and enslaved. And then imagine, I don't know if you can see me, just three, four feet to lie in lengthwise and a couple of feet head, I mean, Oh my God, a couple of feet um, that you would have above you or you're, you're laying in, I'm trying to describe it. And imagine three, four, five, six layers like that. And it's hot and you're terrified and you're traumatized and you're packed together so that you can barely move. Imagine the blood, the feces, the urine, the stench. Imagine lying on the bottom of that for weeks at a time. Imagine the insanity that must have ensued. We never talk about that. The mental illness that must have ensued as a result of enslavement. And all of that is my argument that we still live with deep in our psyches. So this is terrorism, this is trauma. And then the images themselves, this one is actually in a museum in Leipzig, Germany, a, a lot, a good portion of the photographs I'm gonna show you tonight are from uh, my own collection, meaning pictures that I've taken largely in museums around the world. This one I think is just called the Negress. And if you hear a little background noise, it's because life is coming back to normal here. It's too hot to close all the doors and windows. And so there's an ice cream truck in the background and a flight overhead going to LAX. So this is real, this is Zoom. So this is a defiant looking African woman. You can see she's bound, but there's a look of defiance about her. She still is maintaining her, what I call dignity. And then here's another one. I wish it was a better photograph. I wish I had a better camera. This is a, a, a bust of an enslaved African in Argentina. Now, 
in addition to enslaved Africans being brought to Americas, to the Americas, Latin America in this case, you also have African saints. And here is one of the most significant of them. This is Saint Benedict the Moor. He is sometimes called Saint Benedict of Palermo. And he is important in, I guess, African-American denominations, including even in North America. This is from a church of, in Pittsburgh, where these statues are from. And here is another statue of Saint Benedict in the Detroit Institute of Art. And then another saint that I just became familiar with uh, through my brother Carlos Chavez in uh, Peru. One afternoon years ago, we drove from Lima to the black community of El Carmen. And there was a massive earthquake. There had been an earthquake at that time. And on the way back, uh, we stopped at a little church right on the side of the road, I guess because it had been relocated there. And I found a statue of a woman I had never heard of before. I think it's pronounced Saint Iphigenia. And here is another picture of her. And here she is, I guess you pronounce it, Evgenia. And she is a saint in Peru. I had never heard of her before. The story is she was an Ethiopian queen or Ethiopian princess. And she was a so-called pagan, a heathen. And she converted to Christianity. And now she's very important, at least to the black folk in Peru. But by far, and there she is again, with the person who was the most important, the most significant of the African saints in Latin America. And of course, this is St. Martin de Porres. St. Martin de Porres, I believe, was born in 1579. He had a, a white father and an enslaved African mother. And he becomes very important. He is more or less the saint, the patron saint of the poor, downtrodden, and oppressed. And naturally, that would include a lot of black folk. And I found images of St. Martin from, oh, I guess Panama all the way down to uh, Peru and all in between. For example, this is a statue of St. Martin. Um, he's also in Brazil. A statue of St. Martin de Porres in Mexico. And there's a whole neighborhood named after him in Esmeraldas, Ecuador. Esmeraldas, Ecuador, which I'll talk about to some extent now I think of another photograph I should have shown. I'll talk about to some extent um, in the next session. One of the frustrating things about presentations, or maybe it's just the way it is, maybe it's exciting, is that you always think about pictures that you should have added. I do so many of my presentations are visual, and I always think about something that I forgot. So I'll try to incorporate it in the next presentation. This is a, a painting of St. Martin de Porres in a poor neighborhood in Esmeraldas, Ecuador. And of course, these are from Peru itself, from Lima. There's a church where he, he lived in, I believe it's a Franciscan church. And whenever I take groups to Peru, I always take groups there, it's very important. You can see where he lived and how he lived. This brother was just a remarkable person and legends abound about him. One of the legends says that he was so pious that when he prayed, he actually levitated off the ground. And in the same church, you can find his skull. And for some reason, the body and the skull are in two different sections of the church. So the body is here, the skull is there. Again, he was born on December 9, 1579, and he died on the 3rd of November, 1639, and this is during the colonial period. Another statue of him, and yet another. And here I am sitting in the room where he is buried, where his, I don't know if you would call it his crypt or his tomb. I was told, even though I didn't even believe it at the time, that the chair that I'm sitting in belonged to him. But I'm thinking now, if it belonged to somebody that lived hundreds of years ago and it's made of wood, I doubt if they would let anybody, including me, sit in there. Now, this takes us to Mexico. And this shows us another interesting phenomenon that comes during the colonial period, and that is the introduction of Black Christ, and specifically miraculous Black Christ in some of the most important churches and cathedrals in all of Latin America. Okay. 
this is during the time the Spanish come in. This is during the slavery days, but there are also other interesting things that reflect the black experience. This is the National Cathedral in Mexico City. And there's yet another photograph of it. And then inside the most important aspect of it is the black Christ. And of course, there are all kinds of explanations for how he turned black. But one thing it causes us to look at is blackness, not just from an ethnic and cultural perspective, but what is the symbolism of blackness? So what is black? What is it symbolically? What is the ethnic aspect of it? How do we define the cultural component? And I'm not sure if I've ever really seen an effective explanation for all of that. Now I've taken these pictures over a period of several years and you notice they change clothes, the loincloth for lack of a better, here, here, and here. These statues are treated as living, breathing entities. And this is another one in Mexico and this is in Merida. So Mexico has at least two of these. I'm going to show you about five from different countries. And then this one takes us to Lima, no, Cusco, Peru. Cusco is the capital of the Andean uh, highlands. It's, I believe it's the second biggest city in Peru after Lima itself is very large and it's a beautiful city. And it's a city largely made up of Native Americans, high in the mountains, high altitude. And there is a miraculous black Christ there. The explanation I was given for this one is that he turned black because he drank poison. And this one you are not allowed to photograph. But on my last trip there, which was just about a year ago, I was determined to sneak one in. Not the best picture, but I wanted to have it. And from earlier trips, I was able to find these postcards. So you have the black Christ of Cusco, and then another very important one is in Guatemala. I think it's pronounced Escupulas. And this one is so important that you see replicas of, of it in different parts of, um, of the world. For example, this one is in a church in San Antonio, Texas. And this is the Black Christ at Escupulas. And here's another copy of it, an older one. I think this one is fairly new. I will go back and check the date. But this one is at least 300 years old. And this is in the Museum of the Americas in Madrid in Spain. And here, this is from a newspaper article in the Los Angeles Times many years ago. Here is the statue of the Black Christ being taken on a procession uh, in Guatemala. One in Colombia. Colombia has a very large black population. And here's the black Christ there. It's not easy to take these a lot of times. Quite often, it's very, very crowded. You know, so you don't have a lot of time to linger in front of the statue. And quite often, there's a glass panel in front of it to protect it. So you're going to get a lot of glare. So there are lots of people, you're forced to move, and there's a lot of glare. And many people don't like it anyway. I think that many people really are devout, who are devout Christians who go to these churches, aren't always fond of tourists coming in, taking photographs. And this is just a sister that I met outside that church. Again, we'll talk about the African presence in Latin America in terms of the people themselves in the next session, but I thought I would throw this in for variety. Pretty young sister in Colombia. And here's the church. And I think this might be the last one. And this is the most recent one I've seen. This one is in Portobello, Panama. This is where the Africans were brought in. But there's also a church with another miraculous black Christ. The story goes, there were attempts to move this on several occasions, but all at once the statue became so heavy that you could not move it. And so that's what you see here. Again, you see the glass case. One other thing, in addition to the black saints and the black Christ, you also have a, a black Madonna that's introduced. Now the black Madonnas, of which I'm very big on, the black virgin statues and icons, miraculous all over Europe, the superstars of the cult of Mary, they fascinate me. And so I was interested to find last year in Chile, 
that a copy of the Black Madonna Montserrat was brought to Chile during the time of the conquistadors when the Spanish first came there. The original is north of Barcelona, it's called La Marinetta, or the Little Black Lady. This one was brought, I think, in 1542 or 1562 to Santiago, Chile. It's now in the oldest church in Santiago. And this is probably similar to what you see in Cuba today. But in this case, the Black Madonna is holding a little white baby. And this is in right on the outskirts of, of um, Havana, Cuba. And one last thing from this period, I, we may go back to it towards the end of the presentation, but I want to begin to focus more on the resistance itself. This is the interior of a church with another uh, Christ that was painted by an enslaved African. All these are tourist attractions in Lima, Peru. Now, this is where this fortress, this poor dungeon, uh, this, yeah, fortress dungeon, this is where Africans were brought in to um, in Veracruz, Mexico. They received a lot of captured Africans. And this led to the revolts or anytime there's injustice, there's resistance. And the most, I guess, sensational, um, I guess that's the term we can use, the most dramatic, or certainly an important chapter in our history in, the, in Latin America is in Mexico in the state of Veracruz, led by a man named Yanga, sometimes called Caspar Yanga. And he was born in Africa. The first sets of resistance leaders I'm gonna show you were actually born in Africa and were probably of royalty, probably royal figures of royal birth. And that is why they were able to command a following. And one of the most significant is called Yanga, who certainly is from some part of West Africa and late, in the 16th and early parts of the 17th century, he leads a revolt and helps establish a Maroon community. Who are the Maroons? Who are the Cimarrones? These were the escaped Africans who went into the interior, went in the bush and established their own communities, their own towns. You could even say kingdoms in some cases. A Yanga town named after Yanga is one of the most famous. So there's a statue of him. I don't know how old it is. It has to be maybe 20 years old, perhaps more. Very, very impressive. And I look forward to taking groups there. So this is a statue of Yanga. We don't know if this is what he actually looked like, but it's a beautiful piece of art. You can see he's got a chain on one wrist and a machete in the other. And I don't know if that's a staff or what that is. He's holding one more time. And when I take groups again, I do group tours. I'm hoping we can do one together with World Beat. We've been talking about it for a while, but this pandemic has kind of gotten in the way. When I go to Mexico, in this part of Mexico in particular, I always take groups there. And we always do a libation ceremony. We call on the ancestors to be with us and protect us and guide us and keep us safe and keep us strong. And this is a nice place to be. And whoever did the statue, or I won't, I'll put it another way, Adjacent to the statues are a series of murals that reflect the resistance of African people in New Spain or Mexico at that time. And somebody in that same mural has put an old neck head. Even they are saying, we will not begin the history of African people in enslavement. This is so important. I cannot emphasize that enough. So these are Africans rising up. Another statue of Yanga. And then now there's a new statue there too, about, oh, maybe, I don't even know if it's five miles away, but this one does not look nearly as impressive to me as the one I just showed you. And he seems more European looking. The other one had, I think, distinct African features. This one, not so much. Now this one takes us to Colombia and specifically outside of Cartagena. And this is a new statue of a man named Biencas Biojo. And he was from Equatorial Guinea, what we can now trace to Spanish Guinea. He was born there. And he too um, was a great resistance leader. And he is credited with founding the first free town of Africans in the Americas. I don't know how true that is, 
but that's the claim that it has. I went to the town last year and there's this, you can see Palenque. And what is, you have these statues or this statue and you only have him from the, the waist up or the, the torso up. And he has these very, I guess, exaggerated long arm and these huge hands as though he's reaching for the sky, reaching to freedom. So these are the kind of things I really live for to go to these various places and document the presence of African people, including those who were at the forefront of resistance. And then there's a head of Binkas Bioho in Cartagena itself. There I am with it. And again, we don't know what he actually looked like, at least I don't. This brother that I'm standing next to is the scholar who has written the most about that town, which the local people just call Palinque, and is known officially as San Basilio de Palinque, but the local people just call it Palinque, and it was founded early in the 17th century. Um, I'm not sure what happened to Caspar Yanga, but Biencos Biojo was murdered. He was tricked by the Spanish, and they killed him. And again, this brother took me there, and he gives tours to the town. It's really worth seeing. Now we're in Panama, and Panama is another interesting place. And this is a map in a museum very, uh, very close to that church where the Black Christ is located. And it's fascinating because you see all of, if you can look closely, all of the African place names, Pulik, Guinea, Rio Congo, Mandinga, Labonga, uh, where are some others? La Mandinga, La Negrita, Congo, Alto de ne Negros. What does that mean? I would gather that it means that these were local communities, maroon communities, the runaways in Panama. And this is such an important chapter. I don't want to minimize the suffering of our ancestors, but I want to stress that we did more than suffer. We resisted. Malcolm X used to say, cotton picking don't move me. But resistance to oppression, that's inspiring. And these are some of the people associated with that. This is a, a drawing or a painting, a, a poster in that Panamanian museum of a man named Luis uh, Mazam, Mazambique. Okay. And one more, we don't have the actual statues. This is a brother named Bayano. And again, all of these brothers were born in Africa and probably of royal birth. And they were captured, they were enslaved, they probably, under, they probably knew Spanish, could speak it fluently, and they became the first generation of African leaders in the Americas as a result of enslavement. And there's a better photograph. And then in Brazil, we have another very, very heroic figure and of course, I'm including Brazil in the context of Latin America. And this is a statue of a bad brother named Zumbi. And Zumbi is one of our great African heroes in the Western Hemisphere. In Brazil, you had the most significant or long lived Palenque or um, community, some would even say a republic of Maroons in the Americas, and it's called Palmares, P-A-L-M-A-R-E-S. And Zumbe is the greatest leader of, the, uh, of Palmares. And this lasted for 100 years. So for 100 years before the Haitian Revolution, Africans in Brazil had their own republic, and he is the greatest leader of that. He is captured, I believe, in November 1699. I believe it's 1699 or 1799. And this is considered a day of mourning even now for the African people in Brazil. In Brazil, Black um, November is pretty much Black History Month because of the exploits of this African called Zumbi. Now later on, I think we'll have time, I'm gonna come back and do a special section on three of these countries. I'm gonna look at um, Brazil, uh, Colombia, Peru, and perhaps Cuba. But I'm introducing the resistance leaders now. And that's a beautiful statue. It's in Salvador da Bahia. And this is in Cuba, Cuba. 
And this apparently was a maroon area. And if you go up these steps in Cuba, um, I believe in, um, it's not far, I believe from Santiago, which is a large black population center. Uh, this is maroon country. And you can go up there and there's a monument, I believe to the maroons. But in Cuba also is another very impressive monument. And these are not maroons, these are insurrectionists. These are people who led a revolt or attempted to. Matanzas province in Cuba was the most, as I was told, the most rebellious part of Cuba for enslaved Africans. And in 1843, there was an effort made to stage a large rebellion. And it was led by a woman named, who comes to be known in history as Carlotta Lukemi. Now I was fortunate enough to visit Cuba three times from December, 2016 to May, 2018. Tourism had opened up and we could travel there. And the first time we weren't able to see it, but the second time I made it a point that we were gonna track this monument down. This is in Matanzas province in Cuba. And this is Carlotta Lukemi in the center, bad sister, great ancestor. And she's a, a healthy looking sister with a machete in her hand, don't mess with her. And these are all from there, my crew, and here's the whole monument. It's very, very impressive. To me, the most exciting thing about being in Cuba as far as monuments are concerned. So I can't get enough of that. Now, resistance takes many forms. Of course, you have the revolts, you have the insurrections, you have the maroon communities. And one of the contradictions with the maroon communities is that whether they be in Suriname or Jamaica, or wherever they were, or in the Spanish or Latin America, there was always something to happen. Of course, these maroon communities were perceived as threats by the hacienda owners, and a lot of pressure was brought to bear on these sisters and brothers. Um, soldiers were brought in, special dogs were used to track them, et cetera, et cetera. So in inevitably, because the fighting was so tenacious, treaties were, were presented. And one of the provisions of all the treaties is that you would be given limited sovereignty, freedom. You would not be returned to the plantation or hacienda. But from then on, if any, if any enslaved Africans escaped and attempted to join the Maroon communities, you would have to return them. So this split the communities. And so the Maroons or Cimarrones have a kind of a dual history. And that tells us that history is nuanced. It's not this or that or black or white, it's, it's nuanced, it's shades. So resistance took many forms. And one of the forms was the um, resistance by the enslaved Africans. Some might be coming late. That was a form of resistance. Why should you be on time to work? Some might be trying to burn the master's house down with the master in it. Others might be poisoning the food of the slave owners. And somehow that's what I read into this that this sister who to me steals the show, this is in, a, now I think of another photograph I should have inserted, who, who steals the show. This is in a muse museum in Los Angeles where I am right now. And she's given this fruit to this hacienda owner and with the look on her face like, I hope I put enough poison in there because this woman's supposed to be dead. And there's another one very similar to it. This is from Ecuador. And this is in the Museum of the Americas in Madrid. These are Costa paintings. These paintings from the colonial period just shows the different racial makeups or castes. And you see different mixtures, black, white, uh, Native American, mixtures of all of that and different categories. So there was a hierarchy. And you can believe that the black people and the Native Americans were on the bottom. These are Costa paintings that you find in many museums. So I'll go to these quickly. And you can even see a level of resistance here. Apparently this guy has gotten out of line and he can't see it here, but this woman has a knife in her hand and she's giving him a lesson. And it's a fascinating subject. Now, let's look briefly at three countries. We have a little bit of time. Let's look briefly at three countries where we can have a little more focus. This is a hacienda near El Carmen, Peru. El Carmen is the major black population center in Peru. 
And this is where enslaved Africans were tortured. It would be brought down into this very small room and chained to this pole right here. Very small room, claustrophobic, and they may be starved to death there. And these images are all from the Afro-Peruvian Museum. This gives the impression that the poor enslaved African was eventually liberated by the military and the capitalists. The museum is still in front of it. And also what surprised me in this museum is the different roles that enslaved Africans play. For example, here you have uh, an African bullfighter. Who would have thought? I never would have considered that. An African caballeros. Look at this brother on the horse. You even had some Africans who came over as conquistadors themselves. More Costa paintings, all from this Afro-Peruvian museum. If you go to Lima, you should see it. Again, Africans being punished. And look at this horrific scene right here. Now, I'm not sure if this is in Africa itself or this is in Latin America, but imagine that, look at this. And this is all in the museum. This one takes us to Colombia. And this is my first visit to mainland Colombia, a place called, I think it's pronounced Puibdo. I felt like I was in Nigeria. I felt like I was in Africa. And I'm walking down the street on a Friday evening with some friends of mine. We're looking for a restaurant to have a bite to eat. And I heard this music. And I really, it was a Friday night. I think it was a Friday night. It was the evening anyway. And I hear it coming from this church. So I go inside the church and investigate and took a photograph of this mural on the wall. And here you have Native Americans and Africans chained up, pouring gold dust in front of this conquistador. This is in the church. And this is where Africans were enslaved Africans were brought into this part of Colombia. This is on the Pacific coast of Colombia. Cartagena, where Bainca's Biojo is from, is on the Atlantic side. And this is the river. And I never figured out what this phenomenon was, but these round things in the sky. I don't remember if I noticed it at the time or when I had the, uh, actually processed the camera. I saw the picture anyway. And now Brazil, let's wind down. Of course, Brazil is important to us for many reasons, but it's, it has the largest black population in the Western hemisphere, the largest African population in the Western hemisphere. And also slavery was not abolished or enslavement was not abolished in Brazil until the middle 1880s, I think around 1886. M Muros of Zumbi, a bust of Zumbi. And this is from this balcony right here is where the Emancipation Proclamation in Brazil was read to the enslaved Africans. From that very balcony, that very window, Africans heard that they were free. This is a, was a slave market. And I think it was recently excavated and there's some argument about whether this area should be developed or whether it should be left for people to see what happened there. A lot of times in many of these countries, the governments want to sweep the enslavement period under the rug. And this takes us to Cuba. And this is in, I believe, Havana. I think Havana, yeah. And this was another slave market. This is where Af Africans were actually bought and sold. In the colonial period also comes a very extraordinary figure. He may have been born into slavery and escaped, I'm not sure, but his name is Antonio Maceo. And Antonio Maceo is a very important figure in the independence struggle in Cuba. And he became a general in the Cuban army. And you see all the red dots. He was shot all those times. He was shot, I believe, 21 times. And it's only the last one that was fatal. Here's his pistol. And in Santiago, Cuba, which is a heavy black population center, you actually have this enormous statue and a museum of the African general Antonio Maceo. Marcus Garvey named one of his ships in the Black Star shipping line, the Antonio Maceo. We're almost done. These brothers here were just working at the place where you have that statue of Carlotta and the enslaved Africans and in the museum there and a drawing of Carlotta Lucumi. I'm sure nobody really knows what she actually looked like. 
This was the punishment tree. And this is where Africans were punished. And it was believed that the revolt that Carlotta attempted to lead was not successful and she was drawn and quartered. Do you know what that means? That means that each, uh, her, both her legs and arms were uh, tied by ropes and horses pulled her apart. And all this was to still fear. One of the interesting things about it, and I'm just gonna take a few more minutes. One of the interesting things about it is that I guess it was 1976, 75 thereabouts, uh, the Cuban government, much to their credit, sent a lot of soldiers to Angola to help fight the Portuguese and the South Africans who were attempting to maintain colonial rule. And that, I, I mean, I think they sent 50,000 soldiers there and they were very important in the liberation struggle. And that was called Operation Carlotta after Carlotta Leukemia, and I appreciate that. As long as Cuba protects Asada Shakur, then they're all right with me. This is the plantation where apparently the revolt was planned in 1843. Wind down, one of the ways that Africans were dispatched in the Southern Cone at least, was to make them shock troops in the colonial armies. This is in the museum in Bogota, Colombia, the capital. And this is the only image of an African I could find was a brother laying on the battlefield. And this is from the Fine Arts Museum in uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. And this shows African soldiers in the colonial armies. And they were put at the front of the armies and a lot of them were killed as a result of that. I think there was a concerted effort to wipe out Africans and Native Americans in these countries. But there are still a lot of black folk in Argentina. And this one takes us to Uruguay. Another one, the only, one, the only thing I could find in Montevideo of an African in the museum was a brother holding a horse. Finally, we look at another important person of African heritage in Mexico. We've finished with this, and this is Vicente Guerrero. And he has an African mother, I mean, an African parent and a Native American parent. And he became the second president of Mexico. I believe he was born, he was either born or died around 1829. And the state of Guerrero is named after him. And he also abolished slavery again. So these are paintings, murals, during the colonial period of the great, I consider him a hero, Vicente Guerrero. And there's an effort made apparently to lighten him up. If you know what I mean, this is a statue of him in Villamosa, Mexico. And you can see a better example here. And this is where he's buried. I found his burial place. He's buried in the bottom of that, in Mexico City, in this place of the great national heroes. Antonio Maceo, let me finish up. His mother is buried there, either his mother or his wife. Another form of resistance, I showed you this earlier. And finally, to finish, because I do want to save a minute for a Q&A, I've shown a lot of photographs and I've covered a lot. I'd rather give you too much than too little. And again, this is a new presentation. So the timing was, I didn't know if it would be too long or what but somehow I've managed to show you well over 200 photographs in only about 45 minutes, that's not bad. This one takes us to Brazil and we finish here with this. This is in a church uh, frequented by black folk over the years in Salvador, Bahia. A brother told me a long time ago that there are pockets of Africa in the Americas that we were taken from Africa, but we took Africa with us. And there are parts of the Americas that would make you think you were in Africa. And I've been to several of these places, parts of Cuba, certainly uh, Esmeraldas, Ecuador, parts of Brazil. They are like black countries in terms of the population. And Salvador Bahia is the center of that. It's a very interesting city that if you go to Brazil, I really recommend that you go and see. You can also see statues of the Orishas from Yoruba or the Yoruba. At any rate, in this church, you have a little statue, and I know the photograph is not the best, it's very dark in there, but you have a statue of the black saint, Saint Martin de Porres. And if you look way down in the corner, you can see a, a little photo 
of the Queen of Poland, the Black Madonna at Jasna Gore Monastery in Chesterhova, Poland. But in the center is a picture of a woman known to us as Anastasia. And there are different stories about Anastasia, but what I was told is that Anastasia was a, a beautiful African woman. Pardon me, but I think all African women are beautiful. I won't apologize for that. And I think that they need to hear it, particularly from black men. You have this, this sister, Anastasia, and she is coveted by the slave master, slave owner, whatever term is politically correct. And she refused to submit sexually to him. And as a result of that, he had an iron mask fitted around her mouth and she could only remove it until she ate or submitted and she never submitted. It eventually rusted, she died. And there's an effort made to, I think even through the Catholic Church, for the Pope who is himself from South America to intercede and officially make her a saint. So this is Anastasia. I've heard different variations of the story, but that's the one I was told and that's the one I'm sticking with. And I'll end with this. Actually, I think I have one more. In fact, I even have a sip of water so I can go out strong. There's a lot going on in this country and in the world right now. And there's this pandemic. There's this guy in the White House. There's a struggle for racial justice. There's a struggle to save the earth. All of these things, women, you know, it was just acknowledged that it was just a few days ago that marked the 100th anniversary of adult white women in the United States just having the right to vote. So there's a lot of things going on in the world. I think to me, it's a historic moment. So you might ask in light of all of that, why are you talking about what happened yesterday? Because I would say, how do you plan for today and tomorrow if you don't know what happened yesterday? I mean, history is vital. Knowledge itself is essential. And you must be able to tell your story from your perspective. As I say again and again and again, without stuttering, without stammering, without whispering, with apologies to no one. It's up to African people to tell their story, our story. And if we don't do it, that's our fault. And I say our ancestors paid a tremendous price for us to be able to speak out against injustice. We don't have the right to be silent. We don't have the right to look the other way and say it doesn't matter or it doesn't affect me directly. We are all in this together. And history is so important. Sometimes I hear people say we need to unite. We all agree with that. But what is the basis of that unity? And I think knowledge itself is it because it's something bigger than all of us. And so that's my message tonight. I want to show one more photograph. I think I have one more. Oh, perhaps, perhaps not. I just wanted to share with you that I'll be giving um, a presentation this Friday and Saturday on black women in history and art. Somehow that slide got left out too, but perhaps I can give some contact information if you're interested in that. You can always contact me at renoko at hotmail.com, R-U-N-O-K-O, -O, and I'll send out the flyer with the details, the times, the prices, and all of those things. But I want to thank Empress Makeda and the World Beast Center for allowing me to come back and do it again and share with you one of the missing chapters in the greatest story that's barely been told. Ashe. Thank you, Dr. Rashidi. And some of those places are incredible. El Carmen and Peru. Uh, people from Peru are watching right now. So <laughs> that's our place. Buenos noches. So big up Peru and keep it going. Um, also, Bahia is incredible. Yeah. Bahia, you have to go to Salvador, Bahia. You know, you start feeling that inside of you uh, when you fly into the waters where the slaves committed suicide you know, jumped off the boat. So it's incredible. Cartagena. So part three will be in September featuring 
an overview of the African presence in Latin America today, including Bolivia, Cuba, Colombia, Brazil, Peru, and Mexico. Mm -hmm. So if you have any questions, we're not gonna take that many. Do you wanna ask any questions of Latin America? Thank you all of you for, for joining us and some schools are here. God, I'm excited. Any well, questions? If people have questions, that's fine. I mentioned two or three times photographs that I should have inserted. And I'll do that the next time, but let me just tell you what they were. One, very important. This one is done in 1599. And it's three black men in Northern Ecuador. It's the first portrait, signed portrait in the Americas. And it's done by a Native American. And the other is a, a black king in Christendom in 18th century Mexico. So the next time we do the presentation of the third part, I'm gonna insert those at the beginning because they're very important. All right. Um, thank you very much. It's always nice having you here, Baba. And we will see you in September. A pleasure, my sister. Have a wonderful evening. Give thanks to World Beat Center and keep on keeping on.